Hey everyone, thanks very much for coming. God, this talk was fun to make, and I'm glad it follows up the last one. Um, I have a few, some of the stuff that I present is a little different than the stuff that they talked about. So just to get a few things out of the way, a couple shout outs to some guys who helped me. Uh, some of them could be here, some of them couldn't. There's a few folks who wanted to be nameless, so their names are printed in black. <laughs> so we're gonna kick it off. My neighbor and his kid are just annoying snots, right? Insert your own four letter word. And God, and the problem is way too much discretionary spending because then all of a sudden one day, this thing showed up and the kid is following it around all over the neighborhood. And you can tell because he's crashing into every car, every house, every tree, and he's running down the street with it. And at night, it's really obvious what he's doing <laughs> because it just shows up and it's like, really dude, that's what the internet's for. <laughs> right? And my initial response on all that stuff is, hmm, maybe, <laughs> take that you little bastard. But if you were here in the last presentation, they say shooting down drones is a problem. And that's okay, I don't want someone shooting down mine. But this got me to thinking. What if the following things were to show up? Such as maybe this. <laughs> Not hard to do, it's actually made the news. Some guys up in New England started mounting semi-automatic semi pistols to their homemade drone. That, interesting. What if this showed up? <laughs> I can see the first shot being fairly accurate after that. It, no one's business. <laughs> what would happen if this showed up? Yet not as cool. So I started looking around online and it turns out that there are a, baz a bazillion regulations and everyone is trying to regulate unmanned aircraft systems, UAS, right? which we call drones or quadcopters. And it turns out most of the regulations that are out there are not to restrict hobbyists. Most of them are there to restrict the government's use of quadcopters and drones. And there's a lot of attacking going on on the commercial space where you have to get certain FAA approval to fly. Um, and it turns out I was flying my DJI Phantom 3 while testing for this presentation over a parking lot and I was watching it and a guy came up right behind me and he goes, hi, I'm actually from DHS's enforcement division for drones in the DC area. And I'm like, oh. yeah. He goes, do you know what the rules are? Yeah. He goes, are you doing this for commercial use? And I said, no. He goes, okay, see ya. And I followed him and I wouldn't let him be. I'm like, hey, I got questions. He goes, dude, I have so many problems about guys flying those things around. And I said, well, what was your last problem? He said, a guy flew his quadcopter over National Stadium and lost it. <laughs> and I said, well, how did you ever find the guy? And he said, easy. Most of the guys who lose these things, you see them running over the hill with their controller. Have you seen my drone? Right? <laughs> And I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, at which point we were waiting for him and we scooped him up. But it turns out that non-commercial use, hobbyist use of drones is largely not regulated. There are a few things that are out there, right? There are no-fly zones around Washington, D.C., and it centers around the White House and it goes out 15 miles. There's actually supposed to be a no-fly zone of five miles around the airports unless you get permission. Apparently the ceiling is supposed to be graduated. As you get closer, the ceiling goes down, but FAA tries in some of their literature just say five miles, that's it. It turns out you're not allowed to fly on military bases. That's considered bad. This came up in the last presentation. You are not allowed to launch or land from a national park. However, you are allowed to fly in their airspace. It is not theirs to regulate. However, they can cite you for reckless endangerment if it potentially could crash on someone. 
and they get people on that, and they confiscate the drone there. There was a guy out over the Grand Canyon filming some sunset. People complained. You know, this guy in the Smokey the Bear hat showed up and, and took the guy away with his drone. Uh, there are temporary flight restrictions that are issued for disaster areas, wildfires, stadiums, large assemblies, and whenever there's going to be a presidential visit, and they do it several hours before and during the visit. Um, you are not allowed to mount a gun on a UAS because technically it becomes a weapon system. There is a 400-foot ceiling. Um, Amazon is now petitioning to try to get several hundred feet for themselves to deliver packages, and then they want a, a ban of 100 feet from everyone. Um, you also have to fly within line of sight, and I have it now counted up to 16 states who have now enacted their own laws. And technically, according to the guys I spoke to at DHS who do enforcement, a lot of that airspace is not theirs to restrict. Now, the five mile area around airports essentially knocks out almost all of New York City with the exception of a few parks. And you're not allowed to fly above the sidewalks in New York City because of the reckless endangerment and safety issue. And then people get nabbed there. In the hobbyist area, um, there's a whole bunch of restrictions that come up, right? If you don't do it for commercial use, you're under 55 pounds, right? You're not interfering with any manned aircraft. You can be good to go. But that's nice and all, but most people don't know the rules because everyone and their brother is trying to create them. This is a listing of all the no-fly zones on the eastern side of the U.S. And damn, that's a lot of them. If you log into Parrot's website, this is a listing of all of the recordings that got automatically updated to their website that shows everyone who is flying on the eastern side of the U.S. Isn't that interesting? Over 2,000 flights in D.C., which is technically a no-fly area, and over 2,000 flights in New York City. Um, if you do a quick overlay of the maps, <laughs> yeah, turns out people are flying in areas that they don't know about. And if they're smart, you know, I say it's interesting. And, and that's nice and all that the rules are all there. But my neighbor's kid is still annoying and I know he doesn't read. Right? And he's not getting the appropriate parental guidance. So it brought me up with the bigger question, is there any way to take that thing down? Graceful or ungraceful? I thought there might be a couple of ways. There's a couple. I can think of a few ways. <laughs> but maybe something a little more subtle would suit our needs. So maybe the next time he's there, he doesn't ca capture video. Maybe it knocks it down and it flies away. And if you've ever seen this guy crash, he actually bounces like that. So let's take a quick look. I'm going to take a look at two different drones, two of the more popular ones on the market. One is going to be the Parrot Bebop drone, which has a 1080p lens on the front. The other one's going to be looking at the new DJI Phantom 3. And if we start by looking at the Parrot drone, we get a rough, list, a rough listing of the specs. And it turns out, sure, we got a quad core, we got memory, we got a top horizontal speed of 45 miles an hour. Wow. Right, Linux, but if you look really carefully at the specs, hmm. <laughs> the thing is its own flying router with DHCP enabled. <laughs> awesome. There's something else I found really interesting if you read the specs. It's got a really interesting GPS chip in there using American GPS and Russian-based GPS. So what happens if I muck with that? Right? There's a couple other things that kick in. Uh, the free, f the f <laughs> easy for me to say, the Free Flight 3 app uh, is installed on your Android device or your iOS device. You can get updates to that. If an update comes out, you don't have to forcibly install that update. You can ignore it. It doesn't come through the App Store. It actually is just sitting there. It checks their website. So you can apply the update. A couple other things that are interesting, the return to home function. And I'm sitting here thinking, all right, if he's flying near me and I want to swat it and get it away, maybe I can take advantage of the return to home function and send that thing back home. The height distance thing is very interesting. If the thing is flying above 10 meters, it will fly back to its original return to home point. If it's flying less than 10 meters, the thing will automatically shoot up 30 feet 
turn, face home, and then fly home in a straight line. So if you have a house where you can pick up GPS and say you're in your living room with a ceiling fan, you may not want to hit the return to home feature because that gets very ugly fast. <laughs> That's how I lost my first drone. <laughs> There's something else I wanted to take a look at, and I see this in your documentation. If the Bebop drone loses connectivity with the controller for 30 seconds, this thing is supposed to fly home. Hmm. Hmm. That makes me want to say, what would happen if I screw with the, the Wi-Fi signal? Or what happens if I screw with GPS? Or what happens if I introduce a magnetic field around the thing? So let's go through it real quick. This thing actually flies with its own MAC address. It's running DHCP. We can actually scan this with a number of tools. I happen to have a pineapple router around. I didn't use Darren Kitchen's Infusion, which is really cool. Actually, I didn't know that Infusion existed at the time. But it's neat. There's an underlying Wi-Fi connection that gets established between the two devices, and then on top of that, the applications talk to one another. So let's introduce ourselves a little mischief, shall we? What happens if we de-auth our original connection for, say, 30 seconds? It turns out the return to home function did not work correctly for me, and I did this like five times. I lost like six propellers at the time doing this test. Here's what it looks like when all of a sudden this thing gets de auth for 30 seconds. It sits there and flies, boink, it just landed. All of the rotors stopped at the same time and it went straight down. Maybe it got lost, maybe it thought that was going to be home, I don't know. But clearly that didn't work, so now I can just walk out into my property and pick the damn thing up. You want it, kid, come and get it. <laughs> maybe there's something else we can do. I got it. Let's give it a quick scan. And it turns out when we scan it with Nmap, <laughs> yep, it's a flying FTP server <laughs> just floating around. Oh, that's awesome. I had 10 devices simultaneously connected to this guy all at once. Only one app was talking, but the other nine were sitting there waiting. We'll get back to that in a second. It turns out this thing is a flying FTP server. And there are two particular directories I found interesting. One was the media directory where the little monster next door was filming videos. And the other was the thumbnail directory. No authentication was required to connect over FTP. I think that's fantastic. So I was sitting there and thinking, while it was in flight, Maybe I can grab his pictures and replace them with something like that. <laughs> that was a fun day. <laughs> yeah, well, that was cool. All right, so, I'm, dude, I'm taking the videos you got of all the neighbors because maybe I want to just see what they look like. <laughs> But then there's this monstrosity, Telnet, wide open, while the thing is flying. Which kills me, so I Telnet directly into the box. And here's a listing of the entire directory structure, right there. Now it's running, it's running BusyBox from like three years ago. Right, this thing I purchased just a couple months ago for this presentation and they never updated BusyBox. There have been something like 10 updates to BusyBox since this came out, but they haven't updated it. But I want you to look really carefully at three things for me. Take a look at those shell scripts sitting right there. <laughs> so, I took drone number two. This gets to be a very expensive research project soon. <laughs> he was hovering in my kitchen. I tell net directly to the box, and all of a sudden I see that. I'm like, that's pretty cool. So I wonder what happens if I type in this and hit enter. I am suddenly greeted with all of that. I was sitting there working in the kitchen, it was hovering, and then all of a sudden, it took out my stove. I was thinking the shutdown feature would gracefully just shut down the rotors and down it would go. This thing 
there was no graceful shutdown. <laughs> it literally flew right by, and I'm like, wow. So if I was one of those cool dudes who got like carbon fiber blades, this is what it looks like in the park. It's flying, hit the command there, boink. <laughs> and down it goes. There is no restart from that. Right? If you go look at some of the software exploits that are out there, it kills a running process and the thing fires back up. This is off. It's done. By the way, in case you missed it, because it always looks better in slow motion, <laughs> if it's running near a wall, it gets updraft and there's no telling where it's going to go. I was going to do that in here today. I fired this up this morning and six wonderful conference attendees had connected to my open telnet connection. <laughs> I'm not bitter, but you did steal my thunder. So there's another thought. I mean, shutting that thing down, great. So I had a coworker who looked at this and said, you know, that's not really epic. You should launch that thing like 400 feet in the air and crash it. And I'm like, well, give me your drone. <laughs> so why don't we just take the damn thing? Right? Kid, you knocked your ball into my yard. I'm going to take it. So we actually have two simultaneous connections to the same drone at the same time. If I am sitting there, and I, again, remember, I had like 10 devices all connected to it simultaneously. This is what it looks like from the iPad that is currently controlling the Bebop drone. It has access, it's hovering at one meter. I ran this inside a hotel lobby, they were not happy. <laughs> this is what my iPhone sees. Okay. I'm connected to the network, but my app's not connecting. This is what we have. Hey, wait a second. Why don't I just send a quick D off? The moment that D off kicks in, the controller automatically says, I'm disconnecting right away. He is automatically having a bad day. So the question I have for you is, in this race condition, who's going to win? If he is running an iPad anywhere near indoors, he is going to pick up his home network or any other network before he picks up his Bebop drone connector, which I think is great, which means he is going to sit there and try to reconnect even though his underlying network connection is not there and it's going to freeze. Meanwhile, on my iPhone, I've connected. I'm there. And I was sitting there and I connected because I de-authed him. My Wi-Fi connection was good. Note the altitude list though on this. It now thinks that is zero. The thing was three feet in the air. So it didn't get an update for that, which means I'm off and running and now I am the guy who is in charge of that drone and he can't do anything about it. If I click the button at the top that says emergency, that thing just falls from the sky and away as it goes, which I think is great. One of the other things that kicks in with the free flight app that runs on top of the network connection, again, it, it's going to pair to any other network before it comes back to this particular drone and I think that's fantastic. Now, for those little enthusiasts who have more money, the Bebop drone comes with an optional sky controller that looks like this. It's supposed to be a range extender. It turns out that that is its own wireless access point too. And it's wide open, which means we can de-off in one of two spots. If we de-off between the iPad, which is literally just sitting in the cradle, it is not tethered, it's just sitting there connecting wirelessly. If I de-off that and I connect my iPhone or my iPad to it, all of a sudden I get these little controller icons sitting right there, which means I have control of you. If I'm nice, I will temporarily send control back to your controller and then I'll steal it away from you. And I can go back and forth, which means he's going to respond all over the place, which means he's mine. I don't have to worry about it. I mean, I think coding would be great, writing an exploit would be great, but the app is free. It's already been developed and Telnet's wide open. So what happens if we start looking around at other areas like GPS, right? And 
this is interesting because if you pull up the specs, there are several very specific frequency ranges used in the US and very several specific ranges used with the Russian GPS system. What if we screw with those signals? Now, there's one teeny tiny little problem with that. It's illegal. Like 18 different ways of illegal. Like you are currently fined $16,000 for every day that you do this up to $112,000 and if you go to the FCC's website, they have a spot where you can report people, they list of all the people that they've sent notices to and find. So what to do? I talked to the DHS guy, I said, hey, I was thinking about doing research and his flat answer was, are you going to cite my name? And I said, of course not. He goes, they would never catch you if you do it just once. <laughs> they can't. Okay, so I spoke to an attorney, an attorney said, yeah, it's, it's still illegal no matter what, they could still come get you, I'm like, you're no fun. I was speaking to a cop, and he said, you know, if you go back and read the specific intention that shows up on the FCC's white, on the FCC's site, they don't want you to put anyone in danger, right, you can't disrupt anyone else's signal. If you showed up here 20 miles away from everything in the woods, and you were being supervised, hypothetically, you could test and no one would know. I'd like to introduce you to my new friend. <laughs> Selling and manufacturing and importing and all that good stuff related to GPS jammers is illegal. This is a GPS test generator. And hypothetically, one could pick this up online for a very reasonable price of $25. He is specifically designed to block these particular frequency ranges. He also has an effective range of about 20 meters, which is kind of creepy. So I go out hypothetically with some people to do a test and I'm sitting there observing. We do the test at which point the police officer says, I'm going to take your equipment now. I'm like, really? He goes, yes, I, there's no way I can let you walk away with that and it's gone, so it's been confiscated in history. But if we were to run that type of generator on the Bebop drone while he was flying, the return to home feature automatically fails, instantly. From the point of view of the drone, it is currently flying, it has GPS, and then all of a sudden everything stops. He automatically goes to hover mode. He doesn't move forward, he doesn't move back, he just freezes. And if he gets GPS signal again, he doesn't resume his take home function, he just stands there. Well, I lost. And he, he's just looking around. Which I think is a very interesting thing. Now it doesn't overwrite what the home position is, it just interrupts the flight home. The same thing could be achieved if you flew under a bridge, or if you were underneath some dense trees, all of a sudden this thing just stops in place, which can be a problem. Uh, introducing a magnetic field around the device, say magnets from hard drives, actually had no observable effect on the guy, which was a little disappointing for me. Now, if you're thinking about taking over someone's drone, say at the hotel at six o'clock in the morning, you bastard, um, <laughs> there's going to be references on your devices that you've made connections to the device. Very specifically, you want to take a look at the Free Flight 3 plist file from your iOS devices and delete that, because that will have date stamps, time stamps, and the serial numbers of my drone in your phone. So you might want to smudge them out if you can. And I think that works. So this thing, I would never fly it around any of you ever. <laughs> what if we took a look at something bigger though? Something bigger than the Bebop drone. Yeah. Okay, not that big. <laughs> Maybe if we took a look at the Phantom 3 that just came out this past June, what could we do there? If we look very specifically at these specs, this thing is designed to have certain geofencing in place because of the incidents that occurred earlier this year. Um, it can fly up to several hundred meters away without an issue. The top horizontal speed is about 35 miles an hour on that. It uses both GPS systems as well. In some geofenced areas it will give you a notice that says warning you're in a bad spot and the other ones it's supposed to automatically take it down where it uses an automatic landing sequence. Um, this thing is very freaky with respect to magnetic fields though. 
it requires constant calibration if you're going to take off anywhere near a magnetic field, and I find that interesting. Hmm. Electromagnetic field interference, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, DJI Phantom 3 updates, I've heard this from other presenters and I respectfully disagree. Whenever an update comes out by DJI for my Phantom 3, I get a warning message right before I take off and it says, sorry dude, you cannot take off until you apply that update. And I'm like, really? It's like, uh-huh. I contacted their tech support on three different occasions to get three different guys and I said, hey, what's the deal with your updates? And they're like, sorry man, that's the way it is. We have an update, you have to apply it to your device. There's no way around it. And I'm like, what if I want to roll back? They're like, uh-uh. I'm like, what if it fails part way through? I'm like, they're like, dude, you're screwed. I'm like, that's your answer? He goes, pretty much. Insert the micro SD card, try again. So, let's kick it off. What happens if we disrupt the Wi-Fi signal going to a Phantom 3? Well, it turns out it doesn't do anything because the Phantom 3 doesn't operate over Wi-Fi, which is kind of cool. But it brings up the other question of what happens if we start to disrupt the GPS signal? Now, if you look very carefully at the GPS app, I'm not talking about what's installed on the device itself. I'm talking about the app itself. It turns out there's a little teeny tiny database called Fly Safe Places. And it's very interesting. As of July 24, that database had 10,914 entries. It contained the latitude and longitude of all of the no-fly places that were listed in it. it. Contained the country ID, the city, the name of the location, what type of shape was around it, what the radius was, whether or not it was going to issue a warning to the user, whether or not it was going to issue you know, a disable, and then there was a timestamp as to when it was added to their database. I very easily downloaded this database and started just changing entries, which I found to be very interesting. So when the DJI Phantom 3 is flying, you get something that looks like this in a very nondescript area. At the very top, it shows a safe to fly GPS indicator. No problem, there's a map in the lower right corner. Hypothetically, if someone were to turn on a GPS test signal generator, all of a sudden everything goes to this. It automatically loses GPS. If I am flying the device and I start to look at its own diagnostics, it comes back and tells me what frequencies it is using to send video, signal back, video signals back to my iPad. Um, when GPS is disrupted, all of a sudden things start getting squirrely. It turns out my video started to become choppy, it had a lot of latency. It also turns out when the return to home feature was working, it lost GPS, the thing was flying, home could be right here, and here it comes, and here it goes, hey, there it goes. <laughs> it missed its home point completely, flew by it. If you've flown a DJI Phantom 3, has anyone here flown a, F a DJI Phantom 3? Aren't they awesome? Lots of finesse to it, right? Not a whole lot to it all of the finesse to my Phantom 3 was completely gone. It's like I was flying this thing all over again. So I'm sitting there and controlling it. I was taking it, it turns out it almost hit someone, they got a little upset. So in slightly windy conditions or if you're near a building, hypothetically, uh, there's a downdraft and then all of a sudden he becomes unstable and he crashes. So it's a combination of the windy conditions and where it's flying along with losing GPS if it started with GPS, which I think is a very interesting thing. There's something else I also noticed. What happens if we play around with the magnetic field around our DJI Phantom 3? It turns out whenever it launches, if it can't get a good magnetic compass reading, it's going to say, hey dude, I can't fly until I get calibrated. So you pick it up, you turn it on all three axes, it says I'm calibrated, you set it back down, if it loses that magnetic field, guess what happens? Sorry dude, I gotta recalibrate again, and you're like, really? I just calibrated you. You pick it up, you twist it, you roll it, you're good to go. So if you were to fly it and say take a couple hard drives from say some of your old hard drives, hypothetically you left them in the area, this thing is not taking off. It'll never get off the ground, which I found to be really interesting. It is very sensitive in that area. A lot of things going on. D off on the Bebop drones and any of the Parrot series very quickly disassociates the controller with the device. Um, 
Yeah, you got to that bottom line, did you? <laughs> Uh, GPS interference definitely screws up the return to home function. It causes the device to stop and the other one it misses its home sequence. If you take a look at the magnetic field, you can't launch with the DJI Phantom 3. It has a lot of performance issues. And then lastly, sure, there's physical objects we can always throw at the things instead of shooting it down just to kind of mess with our people. There are tons of references in this space on looking up what people are doing, what regulations are there. They are constantly changing. People are passing laws, regulations in all sorts of jurisdictions based just on personal opinion. Well, I just don't want them in my space because it'll annoy my quiet time at the beach. Okay, well, your screaming kid annoys me at the beach, all right? I'm not disbanding him and sending him away. Leave my drone alone, right? But there's all sorts of rules. You can also go through and take a look to see which type of frequencies are allowed in different regions and which ones aren't. So it's going to vary from country to country. It was a fun research project. I knocked my neighbor's kid and his drone offline. Thanks. <laughs> I'm almost afraid to do this. Do you have any questions? I, I have a question. Yes, sir. You in the front. Can you give me the wireless mic so I can get other people's questions? Yes. Anyone have any questions? All right, for, I'm going to go see my friend over there. I'll be right back. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned interfering with a GPS signal. Um, how about modifying or sending it a GPS signal with different coordinates? You, theoretically, you can do that since GPS L1 is not encrypted. You could send a signal provided your signal is stronger than that of, say, the official signal you could very easily tell it it's somewhere else without any problem. I mean, no problem. Easy to do that. All right, if you have questions, come up here and queue up so I don't have to walk my fat ass around the room. Cool. Thanks very much. Oh, uh, I'm waiting. All right. Um, I think uh, Stevenson's in New Jersey, right? You're, you're, or is it Maryland? Hmm? <clears throat> You're where you teach. Is that in New Jersey or Maryland? Or? Maryland. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Cause in the, <clears throat> I thought it was in New Jersey. But anyway, the New York... University, not the Institute. Oh, okay. There you go. Anyway, in the New York area, the past couple of weeks, there's been a couple of, of drones buzzing. Commercial aircraft are coming in. Uh, and that, that's like 4,000 4, feet. But what happened to the, you know, the geofencing and the 400-foot ceiling and everything? Right. So in the DJI Phantom 3, you can actually turn off that ceiling limit and it will prompt the pilot to say, hey dude, the FAA says 400 feet and you can be like, yeah, whatever. The thing can go up to about 1,500 meters. There is a video of a guy in Sweden who decided it would be a great idea to take his phantom drone, fly it up 1,000 meters above the clouds to sit there to get some views and then all of a sudden, oh crap, I lost control of it. I can't bring it down. It'll come down eventually. And it crashed 500 meters away. And he said, oh, I was safe. He got ridiculed online. He's like, whoa, 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 I'm, I'm, I was good. They're like, no, dude, you're an idiot. So you can turn off that feature. You can also go into A mode, autonomous mode, and just fly. Why is that possible? Shouldn't that be deactivated? Technically, right. So he wants to know, is it possible? Why is that even possible? And the idea is you can very easily turn that off. Theoretically, you could get permission from FAA and the air traffic control tower to fly in an area, provided you register with them for commercial reasons. So you could have a reason to fly that high. So you could turn it off. Right. It's up to the flyer to take control, at least right now. I don't think I, I don't think your head is beautiful. Mm, probably not. How's it going, Michael? In your research, you mentioned that, that the Phantom 3 controller was not using Wi-Fi. Were you ever able to figure out how that controller worked? Right. I was looking and I know it's doing communication over some RC channels, traditional RC channels, and I just haven't had time to go intercept that traffic. Okay, like the light bridge stuff. on the, okay. It, something other than the 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz range. So typical RC controllers, I couldn't get that. The video comes back. Have you played around with the 3DR Solo at all? I have not played around with that yet. Okay. Yet. So you mentioned that you were able to pull down the database and look around inside it for the no-fly zones. Did you experiment at all with making your house a no-fly zone? Technically, there are certain websites where you can register your property as a no-fly zone. 
I added a database entry real quick, but I hadn't had a chance to finish everything. I took out several entries and went back and forth. So was there any authorization required to connect to that and download it, or were you able to openly connect to that and download it? Like, would you be able to do that to your kid's DJI Phantom 3? Yeah, right? the DJI Phantom 3 app and the Bebop Parrot Drone app are all free for anyone to download. So you can download it specifically to your iOS device and then pop out the database and start messing with it and looking around. But what I'm thinking is your neighbor's drone, can you connect well, to that, download the database, upload well, no, no, your no, house, the, and then send it back to his drone so he doesn't know why, but all of a sudden he can't fly around your backyard? I like your thinking, but the database is stored on his controller, oh. not on the drone itself. Yeah. So question about the, uh, I guess, the, the database and the GPS in relation to the regulatory structure for drones. So my understanding is that the FAA has a regulation around no-fly zones that's predicated on the database and the GPS being accurate. So is there anything that you know of either that the FAA is doing to require stronger authentication or inhibit GPS jamming? In that regard? No, I'm, I'm not okay. familiar with what the FAA is trying to do in play in that fair. space. Um, and then the follow up is uh, so if I go in and I spoof GPS, not turn it off, mm -hmm. or if I spoof the database, would I be able to technically fly the device in a no fly zone? Well, technically, right now, if you went in the Bebop drone, I could fly anywhere. Okay. The Phantom 3 drone, I can put it in autonomous A mode instead of P mode. P mode uses GPS, A mode doesn't. Technically, I could fly that anywhere which is kind of crazy, yeah, right? And people who are doing DJI drones wouldn't have any of that stuff and they can fly their stuff anywhere. Right. So Thanks, crazy stuff. Uh, one comment, one question. Um, I fly model planes, I also am a hang glider pilot. So very familiar with the FAA and what they like and what they don't like. So one comment would be, number one, it needs an organization privately for somebody to say, hey listen, we don't like the regulations that you're running, so there's the United States Hang Glider, Paraglider Association. Of course, the AMA is an association for RC modelers. So I would think that's one area we need to go in and if we don't like what everybody else is going to come up and write for us. Number two, I love the way that Telnet was on there. That was awesome. What I was curious about was, was were you able to Telnet into it while that other person was still in control of the Yes. The, does that, so my next step was, well, why don't you just like go into the little kid's app? Could you... Well, the you, idea is the you, app is on his device. Right, but were you able to then traverse back down to him possibly? I didn't bother. I just stayed on, on the, the device itself and I just knocked it down. So while someone was flying that Bebop drone, someone else, I telnet it directly into that Bebop drone while it was running. I had three other devices acquire DHCP addresses and then with the Telnet connection I just issued the shutdown script and boom, down he went. How about R and minus R? I could, it, theoretically, I can play in there all day. Um, you said that you were able to disrupt the flight by jamming the GPS signal or? I, or well, jamming would be illegal. Okay, well, me messing with the GPS signal. Right. Uh, were you able to regain control of it uh, just by switching it to attitude mode in that case? Um, in, on the Bebop drone, once a GPS signal that was being interfered with went away, mm -hmm. He re eventually reclaimed his own GPS and then the return to home feature worked again. Okay. On the other one, the moment that that signal was disrupted, when it reclaimed GPS and it was much faster, then it was fine and then away it goes and finesse came back. The interesting thing on the Phantom 3 is if you also take a two inch by two inch square of aluminum foil and put it directly over the top of the DJI Phantom 3, completely interferes with all of the GPS signal reception. All of it. Just like that. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Patrick Tucker with Defense One. <clears throat> so, uh, some uh, uh, thanks for a great presentation. A few of the issues that you mentioned aren't uh, entirely new. Many of them are. C did you approach the either manufacturer with any of these things that you found? Uh, and follow up to that, if you were to make a recommendation to policymakers or FAA people about how to deal with some of these vulnerabilities, what would that recommendation be? My recommendation, quickly back to Parrot, would be, dude. Would you please shut down the services while the damn thing is in flight? Please, okay. at least for mine, right? The other ones, I mean, it would be nice if there was some database that was reliable and I couldn't get to and muck with and that sort of thing. I don't think they can fix anything about GPS interference. Fly under a bridge and all of a sudden you have interference sitting right there. With respect to policymakers, yeah. I'd like to see policymakers get informed before they start making decisions. 
that's a nice way to go. Thanks. And did you, um, did you approach the manufacturers with any of this stuff? You're going to have to repeat that one more time. Did you approach the manufacturers with any of the vulnerabilities you found? You know, I, I spoke to several people who, are, who wouldn't speak to me officially from Parrot, and they're like, we, we're designed to be open so people can do development. Both products came out on the market saying, we have waypoint capability where you can program it for the Phantom 3 and for the Bebop. No. You don't, actually. It turns out it's not there. They marketed it that they had it, and I'm like, this is going to be awesome. I get it. Wait a second, it's not there. I can't find it. I go to their forums, and people have been complaining for months that Parrot says, yeah, we're going to get to it. We're going to rely on third-party vendors to help us solve this problem. And I'm like, well, that's disappointing. Phantom, the Phantom 2 has waypoints that you can program. The Phantom 3 does not. So it would be nice if they got that moving along, which would be helpful. I haven't talked to anyone at DJI. I did speak to someone who gave a presentation maybe an hour ago. I said I kind of disagree with your statement that I don't have to accept to an update to a DJI Phantom 3. And he goes, oh, really? I'll have to check on that. <laughs> Bad answer, dude. <laughs> Suppose you get access with the FTP and then download the images and it turns out he actually has been taking pictures of your daughter in the shower. Where do you go with that? Thank God I don't have a daughter. Say what? Okay, suppose you did. <laughs> so he's taking a picture of me. Okay, well, I don't care who he takes it, but you've downloaded the picture. It's obviously an inappropriate photograph that he's taken of a family member, invasion of privacy. Do you take that picture to somebody? What, what are your options legally, et cetera? What are my options legally? It de so one, I'm not an attorney. Legally, if someone were to, peeping Tom rules would apply at this point. Certain states are issuing privacy laws on drones. It depends from jurisdiction to jurisdiction as to what's happening. So the idea is at that point, you go to the police and say, hey, dude, my neighbor took a picture of me in the shower through his drone, and then you let them handle it. And what do they say to you that the fact that you were absolutely, you got the picture, or do they care about that? Or they made it open anyway, so you, you I mean this in a very nice, respectful way of our law enforcement brethren. Usually when I tell them something like that, they never get to that question. Got it. Thank you. They're off following the kid. They, they've never come back to me and say, well, how have you gotten that picture? Well, it. it was right there and I just took it. Here. Thanks. Hey, I noticed that a lot of the new manufacturers have embedded the um, app in the controller. and They're running on Android. Have you checked any of that out? Do you have any future plans to see what vulnerabilities are in? I'd love to play with Android. Right now I was focusing on the drone itself, not necessarily the controller. I just happened to peek into my iPad and my iPhone just to see what was there. I have to think Android is going to be very similar. similar. But then again, when he's flying, I'm not looking to disrupt his controller. I want to take a look at the drone itself. Okay, yeah, just curious. Flying. Thanks. So, cool. I, I like the idea. I just haven't gotten to it yet, and it's become a very expensive research project, crashing drones, my own drones. Yeah, I found it quite interesting that uh, with both the Bebop and the DJI, you were able to uh, connect another thing in flight. I could not do that to the DJI Phantom okay. 3. I could do that to the Parrot drone. Okay, that, that, that is actually pretty good. Um, I've noticed that a lot of drones have kind of favored availability of uh, connecting and flying over security. Um, this is true with, you know, the, the Bebop there and... Uh, you know, e e even with uh, some of the open source stuff, if you're not using an AES encrypted radio. Um, what do you think uh, are the next steps for manufacturers to take in terms of uh, securing their drones so that uh, they can't be taken over mid-flight? It depends on what it's being used for, right? If you're going to do hobbyist work and you're flying indoors, I mean, I think it would be great if we hung a couple nets here and did drone races. I mean, that would be fantastic. Everyone show up with your own, you know, do-it-yourself drone, we'll zip around, see who takes out the wall, takes out the goons, mm -hmm. right? And in that situation, I'm not really concerned outside, but I mean, you can apply the same logic to other things in our society, right? Oh my God, someone has a gun. He could use the gun to do anything, right? What are the gun manufacturers going to do to prevent some guy using it irresponsibly, right? So we have the same sort of thing here. Now, if we're not careful, and if the community doesn't put in the appropriate self guidance, right, you know Congress is going to legislate the hell out of it. If it moves, Congress will attack it if it makes the press. So I think there's a limit as to how far we should go. Otherwise, we'll completely kill the market. It won't be fun anymore. 
Thank you for the talk. Um, sure, I was, you're welcome. Thanks uh, for coming. <laughs> thank you. I was wondering, um, I've seen that your presentation was very focused on um, vulnerabilities and exploitation. As far as the Wi-Fi based um, uh, devices, have you researched anything to do with uh, securing your own personal drone? You know, I have my first thing to do was to see what I can do to knock it down. The next thing I'll do to see what I can do to shut down particular services while it flies mm -hmm. to make it a little more bulletproof. Mm -hmm. Bulletproof. Um, I just haven't gotten to that yet. Uh, um, to add on to that, would you be interested in finding out by chance afterwards? Sure, man. I'll email address on the end of the cool. last slide in the presentation. Drop me a line. Thank if you, you very want much. If you copy the presentation, drop me a line. Cool. Thank I'm you very much. I just had one more question uh, regarding, have you played around at all with ADSB? Um, okay. I have not. Are you familiar with that? And not, not so I can speak intelligently on it. Okay. <laughs> what happens if you fly uh, the, the Phantom through a magnetic field instead of having one uh, you know, around it so it can't take off. If it flies through a strong magnetic field, what happens? I haven't tried it yet, but if interference to GPS is similar to the magnetic field, I imagine it loses a lot of its finesse. The DJI Phantom 3 has a lot going for it. I mean, it is not a lightweight product. I mean, it has a ground sensor, it has a ground facing camera, it has a barometer, it has a ma magnetometer magnet in there, it's got GPS. So if I take out just one of them, I assume that whole thing is still going to be flyable without any issue or with minor issues. The problem is what happens when you get close to another object or a wall and then you have the extra air and then you lose that stability. That's when I think you're going to run into problems. I just haven't found a way to take a magnetic field and project it to this thing while it's in flight. I'll get to it. Right after I do my DeLorean and get it up to 88 miles an hour, I'm going to find a way to project a magnetic field into a particular spot, like right around his head, and take care of that. I, I would prefer you don't project a magnetic field on my head, but thank you. All right, so if anyone else has any questions, we will take Michael out to the chaos that is the hallway. I want to thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, and actually, on behalf of Speaker Operations, I want to Sweet. present you with that badge. Cool stuff, man.